Council Room 123, and a quorum is present. Today, members, we're going to take up two proposals. We're going to hear Senator Kupex, Senate File 2218, and he is here and ready to go. And then we're going to take up the first of our three of this committee's omnibus bills, um, that being the policy omnibus bill, um, which is a bill that contains provisions that have been moved and heard in this committee already. We'll take that up in a little bit. But first, um, Senator Kupek, welcome to the committee. Um, if you'd like to introduce, your, introduce yourself for the record and proceed, we've got Senate File 2218 before us. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Could you speak into your microphone? I'm doing my best. You know, the thing with being short. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the thing with being short. <laughs> but thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Kupek, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Rob Kupek. I have uh, Senate File 2218, which is to establish a grain indemnity fund in Minnesota. Uh, after years of elevator collapses, uh, this will finally provide meaningful protection to producers who sell grain in Minnesota. Uh, in short, the problem for farmers is that when they sell grain to an elevator, they don't often, uh, they don't collect payment right away. In effect, they are extending credit to the elevator. So what happened, what's happened now seven times since 2015 is that elevators uh, go under and are not uh, able to pay out those farmers. Uh, in any business, that's devastating, but in farmers, in farming, you work all year uh, to market your crop, and once you do, have, uh, have it uh, to pay your inputs and invest in the upcoming year. Not getting paid for delivered grain puts farmers in an incredibly difficult position. The indemnity fund proposed under my bill uh, would protect producers. Uh, now, you may want to ask, why should we have a program uh, specific to elevators? Uh, in my mind, the big reason is that grain elevators hold community wealth. When they go under, they aren't just consequences for that business, but all of the farms that entrusted them with their grain, the businesses whose farmers uh, who owe their uh, inputs to farmers and so on. We've likely uh, all read about the FDIC and how they're making depositors whole after Silicon Valley bank failure. Uh, that's kind of the same principle here. Uh, a couple of details on my bill. Uh, the long-term funding mechanism for this fund is premiums assessed on sold grain. Uh, to build the fund up to $15 million from $5 million, the Department of Agriculture estimated they had to have assessed $7 on every 10,000 of marketed grain. Uh, that's pretty cheap insurance. My bill funds uh, the program right away so there will be no buildup costs. It will be ready to go. If nobody uh, touches any of that money, if no elevators go under, there will be nothing assessed. It's only when the, it drops below $9 million that this assessment would kick in then to replenish uh, the funds in the, in, in, in the fund. Um, second, and uh, relatedly, uh, there are protections in the bill to ensure that once the Department of Agriculture pays out farmers, they're able to act uh, as a party to the bankruptcy to work to recoup money on also on behalf of the state. Uh, and sparing you uh, any more details on this, it's my understanding that this proposal here is before the committee because it does authorize the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to undergo rulemaking to carry out this proposal, and that is on line 4.2 of my bill. Thank you, uh, Senator Kupek, very much. I understand you don't have testifiers. I do not. I have somebody here who is a wildly incredible expert on grain indemnity if you have questions. Thank you, Senator Kupek. And for members, when we move this bill, we will be moving it to the Finance Committee next. Uh, we do have a fiscal note in our packets. Uh, if our fiscal analyst would just like to speak to that, please. Yes, I can do that, Madam Chair. Uh, the microphone on. Uh, so the fiscal note is a, a relatively short one. Well, as Senator Kupek noted, while the bill is here because it expands the uh, rulemaking authority for the department, the fiscal note does not assume that any rulemaking will actually need to be conducted. So the Office of Administrative Hearings is not on the note, nor are any other uh, agencies that are in state government's jurisdiction. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Uh, members, do you have questions for Senator Kupek? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we heard this bill in, in agriculture, and I recall Senator um, Dames making mention of it from the standpoint that farmers can access an insurance policy to cover their grain losses if, if such a thing, a catastrophe, uh, where a grain elevator would be going under. Uh, he was not in favor of this bill as it stood. He felt that uh, $15 million was a lot, and then 
the fact that once it falls below, below or the fund falls below $9 million, then it's uh, back on the, the farmers themselves to make sure, or it's back on the state to come up with the money for uh, filling that money back up to keep it at $15 million. So uh, from what Senator Dames had been his background, his knowledge, his understanding that uh, the uh, farmers, if they would choose to, could take an, out a policy on their grain as it was being delivered to the elevator. And uh, that's what I was uh, understood to be saying. So I, will, I voted against the bill in committee, and I will probably be voting against the bill today. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Other questions from members? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also serve an egg committee, and I just wanted to pour, point out support for Senator Kupek's bill. Um, our current system fails to protect farmers. Senator Kupek's bill also creates a desperately needed rainy day fund to help make farmers whole when the elevators go under. Um, I would encourage people to vote yes on this. I will be supporting this bill. I also heard testimony in agriculture, and uh, many, many farmers gave pow uh, powerful testimony as to why this was needed. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe, uh, Senator Kupek, can you tell us, okay, so we, we're going to have rulemaking authority, and we're going to basically tell the executive branch, uh, please fill in any dots that need to be filled in. Oh, there aren't dots on this bill, Madam Chair. But uh, <laughs> it's at, and uh, uh, the please. door is open, and it is, it is really hard. I, I, hard to hear what you're saying with whatever's yeah. going on out there. But if you could repeat that, I would appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Lang, for getting the door. <laughs> I appreciate you. that. <laughs> Senator Draskowski. The Sentinel, stationed by the door, Madam Chair. That's right. For those Senator of us Draskowski. who are in FFA, there's Senator Lang. Um, so, um, Senator Kupak, um, what, uh, what details does the executive branch need to fill in here? What additional um, um, authority are we going to give him, give them in this bill to basically write rules that carry the full effect of force, full force and effect of law? Senator Kupak. Madam Chair, if I could bring in my grain indemnity expert here, that, if, that there's been a panel that has been working on this for a few years, and uh, I think he could probably speak better to what that would be. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Milanowski. I'm the program manager for the Fruit, Vegetable, and Grain Program within the Department of Agriculture. Mr. Milanowski, is that correct? Mr. Milanowski, yeah. Nick Milanowski. All right. Uh, did you understand the question from Senator Jaskowski? Uh, the question, if I can repeat it, is uh, what sort of rulemaking do we intend to, to make uh, initially uh, upon the implementation of the bill? Yes. Uh, we don't have any planned rulemaking right now, um, but we have used rulemaking in the past to <coughs> clarify how we sort through claims uh, against the bonds currently, and we expect that there will be some uh, gray area that we need to navigate as we uh, implement this bill and uh, sort through the claims, um, making sure that we are removing uh, references to bonds and making references to the indemnity account as it exists. Is that Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I think we heard that there's really not any identified, so our, I guess a follow-up question, are there any identified specific areas that uh, can you give us an example of an area that of the bill somewhere in here where you're going to need to um, you're going to need to do rulemaking to make it clear and operational, Mr. Malinkowski. Madam Chair and uh, Senator, the the current rules make reference to bonds and bond claims. Uh, that's the current system that exists. We will need to uh, make sure that those rules are adjusted accordingly to reference the indemnity account and how we. Uh, draw upon that account and, and sort through those claims. And so right now that is where we think we're going to have to clean up the rules and, and modify them. Okay. Senator Draskowski. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malinowski. Thank you for your answers. Um, Madam Chair. Senator if Draskowski. I, if I could go down the same lane uh, as Senator Anderson did. Um, you know, I've, uh, 
I've spent a, a great deal of my life around agriculture. I grew up on a farm. I studied agriculture. I was an ag agent for 15 years with extension service. I've been on hundreds of farms. And members, I can tell you that um, farmers are the last people in the world that want to go to government and beg them to do the things that they need to do themselves. Uh, we have before us a bill uh, that, that uh, brings the responsibilities that farmers and egg co-ops and, uh, and others handling grain have been doing for generations. And suddenly before us we have a, a $19 billion over collection of the people's money and the first reaction here is to bring a bill that uh, brings farmers to be yet even more dependent on government. Uh, this is not the right solution. This is one uh, that doesn't need to happen. Uh, I don't think Senator Kupek, um, I think, uh, I, I guess I would ask Senator Kupek, can we not adjust the limits in the current law in order for uh, farmers and uh, grain handlers to be able to continue to operate independently and not be subjects of the government going into the future? Senator Kupek. Sure. Well, uh, what we have done in the past here over the last few years is we have made um, we have made uh, farmers basically buy and elevators buy insurance uh, that is fairly also fairly costly. And one of the amendments we made when it was in the Agriculture Committee was to strip that out. So there is actually going to be a huge savings uh, for farmers in this bill by making that by not requiring them anymore to buy this ins this insurance that they were buying. So we already had that. That was something that was in place. So we're taking that out now. And then there is an opt out in this uh, bill. So if you decide, obviously, uh, if you store your grain with CHS, uh, if they go under, we have much bigger problems. And so you can opt out and actually not pay into this uh, if you want to. And it, it is. I mean, yes, we went on for years where we did not have these problems. But obviously, uh, over the last seven years, for a variety of reasons, we have seen elevators fail and we have seen uh, farmers get left on the hook for that. So this addresses uh, something that has been a growing problem. Because at first we thought, oh, it's just a couple, and we remedied it. We tried to remedy it one way. That that did not seem to work. So we're coming back with this. Um, this seems like a, a proposal. If we can just give a little bit of money up front, it's a very cheap form of insurance. The insurance they currently uh, are available, it's actually through the elevators. Uh, so, and very few people actually purchase that. So when we did hear testimony in the agriculture committee that was talking about how this insurance was already available to them, they also didn't exactly weren't honest brokers saying that, oh yeah, and by the way, we're the ones buying insurance, and it was only available about 10 elevators around the state. So um, yes, there was something there not taken advantage of, uh, and also kind of a, a double agent working on that side. So we looked at this as a, a maybe a better solution uh, for solving a problem that unfortunately has continued here over the last seven years. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Kupek. So, Senator Kupek, could you point us to the place in the bill that allows the farmers to opt out of the tax that you wrote into this bill going forward? It is. Thanks for looking, Senator Kupek. And um, again, the jurisdiction of this bill today is in the rulemaking. I, I appreciate the questions, but hope that we'll focus. Which section? Yeah, do you have the opt out section? Do. It's in there. <laughs> There it is. It's on page 8, uh, section 8.19 is where the opt-out begins. So, so, Madam Chair, I'm wondering if Senator Kupek, could you describe for us how farmers opt out of this new tax that's put in there? I'm, I'm curious why this isn't going to the tax committee as well, Madam Chair. Uh, so the way the my, Madam Chair, the way uh, my, Kupek. sorry. <laughs> Matt, the way I understand the opt-out to work is that uh, if, first of all, there's no charge until the fund drops below that $9 million threshold. If there is an assessment on that, it is assessed on, on the grain, and then they would file a card to then, if they wanted to opt out, get the money back. And we talked about having it as an opt-out at the beginning, and then it actually 
uh, the, not only was the Department of Agriculture against that, the elevators were against that because they said that would just make the bookkeeping so unwieldy and complicated. We prefer, because other programs do it this way, to just do it this way, that then they would file that card in and get it back. And it is a fairly uh, small amount per the amount of grain they're, they're getting in. It would really be a couple of hundred dollars for most farmers that they would be getting back. Thank you, Senator out. Kupek, and I'll remind us one more time that this bill is before us about rulemaking. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Kupek. Uh, I don't agree with the, the philosophy behind the bill. Um, I think we're going to make farmers yet more dependent on our government uh, and subjects of the government over the long term. Um, but thanks for bringing the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I have absolutely nothing to say about rules. I just wanted to comment on the bill as a whole, and then I will move on if that would be okay with the Chair. Please proceed, Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. What we basically have done is create, uh, as Senator Draskowski mentioned, more dependency on the government to be the watchdog to make sure the farmer gets paid. Why not take the approach that when the farmer delivers the grain, they will be paid immediately when they deliver it. If they can't be paid for, and then the storage at the elevator would be paid for the for by the buyer. Why not rearrange it that way? And that's my comment, and we'll move on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Barr. Senator Kupek? Sure, and I think there are a variety of reasons why at the time farmers bring to the elevator that they do not get paid right away. I think some of it is sometimes the elevator is still waiting for money to come back the other way. And sometimes there is just that, if I just wait a day or two uh, trying to you know, play the market a little bit that I may get just a couple of more cents or dollars on my product. So that's one of the reasons why. All right, uh, seeing no further questions. Oh, Senator Lang. <laughs> Sorry, Madam. Yep. Uh, just, just one question, I guess, more than anything. Uh, is there anybody that testified against this in another committee? Or you did have a letter of support from the Farmers Union, but I was curious about Farm Bureau, maybe the corn growers, uh, any of the other commodity groups that, you know, there's several hundred within the state. So I was just curious if, if anybody testified against or anybody has said, hey, we're not in favor of this bill. Senator Kupak. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the soybean growers uh, were uh, with us on this bill. The corn growers took a more, they just took a neutral stand. They had been previously uh, not in favor of this bill before it had the opt-out. Uh, and then once we put that availability to get the funds back, they, they were neutral on the bill. The only testifiers before the Ag Committee, if I remember, uh, were some of the elevators that were not in favor of this. Thank you, Senator Kupak. Senator Lang? All right, seeing no further questions, we're gonna to move to the vote. We've got three remote voters, so I'd like you to turn your cameras on and let us know where you're at. Senator Morrison, Senator May Quaid, and Senator Fate, and it appears Senator Carlson. Senator Jeskowski. Uh, we certainly can have a roll call. Senator May Quaid. Aye, I'm in a... Hold on, just let us know where you're at, please. Apple Valley. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Deep Haven. Thank you. Senator Fate. St. Paul. Thank you. Senator Carlson. All right. I will move that Senate file 2218 uh, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Finance. A roll call has been requested. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Murphy? Yes. Vice Chair Mitchell? Yes. Lead Anderson? No. Senator Barr? No. Senator Carlson? He's not here. Senator Swazinski? Yes. Senator Dreskowski? No. Senator Fate? Yes. Senator Gustafson? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Curran? No. Senator Lang? No. Senator May Quaid? Aye. Senator Morrison? Aye. There being uh, seven ayes and six noes, the motion is adopted. The bill is on its way. Thank you, Senator Kupek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee. Have a good afternoon. 
Members, next we're going to take up uh, the, the policy omnibus bill, Senate file 1424. Um, and I'm going to present that bill. So Senator Mitchell is going to take over chairing the committee. Uh, I want to let you know that uh, this bill uh, contains provisions that have been in this committee. Um, there aren't any new new bills or new ideas. It is stuff that we've all heard. We've, we've you know, debated, voted on, much of it laid over. Um, and we have people who are here uh, to offer their perspective, but we don't have a lot of testifiers. We do have the room scheduled for this evening. Um, so if we are unable to finish our work um, in the time that's allotted, which is now about an hour and 20 minutes or so, uh, we will come back tonight to finish it up. I want to make sure everybody knows that there's plenty of time to do our work. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to go over there. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Well, Madam Chair, I'm just a little disappointed in the fact that this bill was uh, posted so late last night that uh, we as uh, members of the committee really didn't have a chance to look at the delete all amendment for this. And I understand we've heard these bills, you've, we've talked about them and we've voted on them or had them, maybe not voted on them, but we've laid them over. And uh, I just, to, to me, uh, I thought there was some rules that there were some guidelines as to when bills should be posted, at least so that uh, individuals on the committees could have an opportunity to look at them. So I'm very, uh, to me, it's not good government, and I am not very impressed with the way it's been run. So uh, look forward to what uh, is going to happen here. And uh, uh, at, at this point, I'm not really in favor of the bill as, as it goes, but we'll see what uh, testimony comes forth. Thank you very much, Senator Anderson. I appreciate that. Senator Jasinski? Uh, Madam Chair, I just want to say a disappointment as well. Looking through the summary uh, that was prepared uh, by uh, nonpartisan, uh, looking at the authors, Swidinski, Murphy, Murphy, Dietzik, Murphy, Mayquaid, Mitchell, Swidinski, Westland, Mer Marty, Swidinski, Herr, Bolden, Gustin, Dibble. Not one Republican bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Um, there are bipartisan authors, co-authors on these bills. I did go through and check. Many of the bills have just one author, which is also the case, and much of it is coming from the administration. Uh, and I hope that um, the work that we continue to do on this, on the other two omnibus bills that are come through this committee, are as bipartisan as we can make them. The last thing I will say is that the bipartisanship that people seek is really an expression of how we work together. And despite there being sharp disagreements in this committee, and there have been sharp disagreements over some issues, there have also been opportunities and continued opportunities for us to work together. And I think that's the real measure of what Minnesotans seek from us, not the list of names, but the work that we do. And I will continue to pursue your input and your ideas as other members are doing the same. Um, and with that, I'm going to head over there, if, unless someone else has another question. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what I think I heard is that every single provision in this bill has been heard by this committee. Is that correct? I said the bills that are here have been. There are a few amendments. Senator Draskowski. Okay, so everything in the, in, the, in the delete all as presented to us, every single thing in here has been heard in this committee. These bills have been heard in this committee, yes. Are there any in here that have not? As I reviewed this yesterday, uh, So, as I said, these bills have been heard in this committee, and as I said, there are a few amended provisions um, that I'm going to talk about when I present the bill, um, and we'll have testimony on those provisions, but we, there aren't bills in here that haven't been heard in this committee. So, Madam Chair, are there any provisions in here that have not been heard in this committee? There, there is an amendment. There are a couple of amendments that are incorporated in the amendment, and we're going to talk about them, yes. And then there are a couple of additional amendments. Um, that are going to come before us. So I'm not following real well, Madam Chair, but is every, th is every provision in this delete everything amendment, has it, every provision that's in here currently, as I hold it, have they been heard in this committee prior to today? Every provision in that bill that you hold before you is a part of a bill that has been heard in this committee. And there are a couple of changes to those bills that are incorporated in that amendment that we will talk about when I present the bill. Gotcha. 
Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for asking the precise question. Anything more? Before I go over there where you're going to grill me. And Senator Murphy is before us with Senate File 1424, the uh, state and local government policy omnibus. Senator Murphy, at your convenience. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I am really delighted uh, to be here with you to present uh, this proposal, which is the first, as I've mentioned, of uh, three uh, omnibus bills that will come through and uh, through this committee. Uh, and one of the things I uh, love about the Senate that is different from my experience in the other body uh, is that I'm joined uh, at the table uh, with council, um, which is going to expedite, of course, our work um, and make clear uh, the contents of this proposal. Um, I am happy to answer all of your questions, your hard questions, and I hope uh, at the end of this that I earn your support. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I will say, uh, that this bill includes policy, policy, excuse me, policy changes that have been heard over the last two and a half months. There aren't very many changes to the proposals as they're here before us again. Uh, there are, in some cases, um, policy in this bill uh, uh, that are connected to, to bills that we've heard and the funding that uh, is attached to the, that those policies will be in the finance bill. So. There are things that have come before us, um, like the information that we heard from Senator Rest and Senator Coran last week from the legislative auditor. There's policy here on that and funding that will go along with that in the finance bill. So I want to be clear about that. There are some provisions that are just policy and the funding will follow. Much of what is in this bill um, is coming from the administration, from the parts of the Walls administration uh, that we have jurisdiction over. There are also some member proposals um, that seek to change uh, and improve the function of state and local government. Um, there is a change to Section 3, which is the part of our policy uh, that deals with the, what we know as the Subcommittee on Employer Relations and how a contract, once a contract is negotiated, how that is implemented. There's a change in Section 6 in the definition of security records, and we're going to hear uh, an amendment uh, to a Westland bill uh, about local government uh, with a change that has come from the League of Cities and from the State Board of Investment. Uh, we're going to add an amendment that represents the bill, Senate File 2224, a Nicole Mitchell bill dealing with data practices. And there is a change uh, that I've already spoken to um, dealing with security records that is the work of Senator Wickland along with Director Weber at the Legislative Coordinating Commission. When I think about this proposal, it is the work of many. Um, it does seek uh, to improve the government's function so that it is serving the people of Minnesota well. And I think about equity, sustainability, and security um, as three of the drivers of this legislation. And with that, I'd like to turn to our council for them to walk through the two articles. Um, and I'm sure that they will, in their very skillful, detailed way, make clear that these are provisions that we have heard before. And again, I hope to earn your support. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Madam Chair, Stephanie James from Senate Council. Um, I'm going to walk through Article 1 of the bill, section by section. Section 1 establishes the Bill and Bonnie Daniels Firefighters Hall and Museum in Minneapolis as the official state fire museum. This is from Senator Dietzik's Bill 1658. Sections... Um, Section 2 is the first of a series of sections from the LCC bill, Senate File 1746. There are some changes that I'll, I'll note as we come to them. Um, section 2 allows the executive director of the LCC to enter into contracts on behalf of the bodies, and it requires the executive director to consult with the chair and vice chair of the commission on contracts over $50,000. 
Section three is the first of a series of sections um, in various places in the bill from Senator Murphy's Senate file 2456. There are some changes to these provisions that I'll note. Um, the effect of these many sections is to eliminate the role of the legislature and the LCC and the Subcommittee on Employee Relations on reviewing and approving or rejecting collective bargaining agreements and arbitration awards. Um, section three includes a change that relates to contracts submitted for um, Minsku. Um, section Um, so that's sections three through five. That takes us to section six on page um, four. Section six, seven, eight, and nine relate to the Cybersecurity Commission. Um, this is part of the LCC bill. These sections are also changed a little bit, as Senator Murphy noted. Instead of a uh, definition of confidential information, there is a definition of security records. All of these sections deal with uh, security measures with the LCC and the Cybersecurity Commission. And these were um, part of Senate File um, 1746, the LCC bill. Moving then to Section 10 on page 5. Sections 10 through 15 are from Senator Rest's bill regarding the Legislative Audit Commission and the Office of the Legislative Auditor. And these um, sections change the appointing authority for the Senate majority members to the Senate majority leader. Um, these eliminate the duties for the auditor relating to reviewing agency contracts. And they make various changes related to the classifications of data and the OLA's treatment of data. And then that takes us to um, page 8, section 16. Section 16 um, is from Senator Murphy's Senate File 1426. This modifies the types of collateral that a bank can provide um, to secure the state's deposit within the bank. Um, this is with the approval of the Executive Council. Page 9, Section 17 modifies the procedure for individuals to challenge the accuracy or co completeness of data held by a government entity about that person. And this section has been modified um, based on an amendment taken in judiciary on the bill um, yesterday, I believe, or this week. On page 10, section 18, uh, Senate file is from Senate file 1220 from Senator Swadzinski. This provides for the Senate in action um, in 60 legislative days to um, amount to consent to the appointment of, um, an, uh, to con um, in the confirmation of an appointee. On page 11, section 19 adds to the list of people who are precluded from serving on the Legislative Salary Council. Um, specifically, it adds the employees of the executive or judicial branch. Um, section 20, um, 20 through 22 are um, updates to the enabling statute for the Legislative Salary Council. They change the time for making appointments and um, the deadline for the first meeting in a biennium. It also gets rid of obsolete language that applied to the first Legislative Salary Council. And that takes us to uh, section 23. On the next page, section 23 creates the Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution. This office is created under the Commissioner of Administration. A similar office is currently under the Bureau of Mediation Services and is repealed in this bill. That takes us to page 14, section 24. Um, section 24 creates an Office of Enterprise Sustainability. Um, this places requirements on state agencies to take steps towards improving sustainable outcomes. Section 25 replaces a section that is repealed. Um, it establishes, <coughs> excuse me, it establishes that the Commissioner of Administration has to require a fee for the use of electric vehicle charging stations on the Capitol complex. Um, this authorizes the Commissioner to set the fee. Um, the, this is, as I mentioned, this is replacing a current section of statute. The current section of statute also has parameters for what the, how to set that fee that are, that are not in section 25. 
Section 26 is from Senator Murphy's um, bills, 1425. Um, these sections 26 through 29 are changes to the state's targeted small business um, contracting program. These sections increase the preferences affordable available to those businesses. Um, it also increases the cap on how much the contracts can be um, for it to be awarded without competition and also allows the use of a national certifying agency organization to um, determine um, which businesses are eligible if the certifying criteria for the organizations are the same as those, as the requirements for those um, sections for um, participating in the program. On page 19, um, Section 30 eliminates a reporting requirement that had a last due date in 2014. Sections 31 through 33 are new, um, but these are part of the proposal to eliminate the legislature's role in approving collective bargaining agreements and arbitration awards. Um, so these are uh, conforming changes with that. On page uh, 21, section um, Section 34 changes the Senate appointing authority for the Regents Candidate Advisory Council to be the majority leader instead of the subcommittee on committees. That's from the LCC bill. Section 35 requires meetings of the Regent Candidate Advisory Council to be subject to the legislative open meeting law. Section 36 on page 21 changes the state agency that's designated to administer the federal act for preserving historical and archeological data. It changes it from the, from the commissioner of administration to the historical society. Section 22 eliminates a preclusion on employees of the historical society serving on a mediation task force um, that mediates disputes between agencies and the state historic preservation office about a project at a historic property. Section 38 and 39 are from Senator May Quaid's Senate File 1927. These allow the use of um, SNAP benefits through the um, Healthy Eating at Home, Here at Home program to be used at direct, for direct farmer sales. Section 40 on page 23 um, sets terms for the members and, and provides for the staggering of terms for the public members of the Mississippi River Parkway Commission. Section 41 is another part of the change to eliminate the legislature's role in approving um, or rejecting collective bargaining agreements. Um, this is slightly different than you would have seen it uh, when the bill was before the committee because of the addition of um, the um, references to the Minsku contracts. Section 42 is from Senate File 2239, a Senator Swadzinski bill. This modifies the list of positions in public safety that are unclassified. On page 25, section 43 eliminates the requirement for the Office of the Legislative Auditor to review contracts between the Housing Finance Agency and public accountants. That was part of um, the Senator Russ OLA bill. On page 26, section 44, eliminates the LCC's role in, in administering the Electronic Real Estate Recording Commission. And on page 27, section 45 sets up staggered terms for the Mississippi River Parkway Commission. Um, for the public members, it sets the terms of the initial, um, of the initial appointments so that they're, they'd be staggered. And then section 46 is a repealer. Paragraph A is the repeal of the Candidate Advisory Council for Minsky's Board of Trustee. Um, the council recommends candidates for the Board of Trustees. Paragraph B is the repeal of the current electric vehicle um, requirement for charging a fee for using chargers on the Capitol complex. Section, or paragraph C is a repeal of the current statute um, for the Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution and the related grant program. Thank you for, Thank you for all of that. Um, are you having Ms. White also? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, it would be great to hear uh, from Council White on Article 2. Council White. Uh, Madam Chair and members, the local government article is not nearly as long as the state government article. 
Starts on page 27. Council White, do you mind uh, stating your name and title for the oh, record? Oh, sure. Joan White, Senate Council. I handle the local government and veterans portion of the committee. Um, the local government policy article starts on page 27. You refer to the uh, summary that Senate Council prepared on page 8. It lists the bills that are consisted that are in the um, Article 2. I'll start with sections 1 to 4. Um, that's on page 27 to 30, and it is uh, Senate File 323. These sections expand the long-term equity investment authority for cities and counties. Sections 5 and 6 are on pages 30 to 31. Um, these sections require Ramsey County Board of Commissioners and the Anoka County Board of Commissioners to directly operate and manage the library count, uh, the county library system. Section 7 to 12 on pages 31 to 34, expand the authority to create, expand, or enlarge a special service district. Uh, currently, special service districts are limited to commercial property owners. Um, and this bill allows for multi-unit residential properties to be included in the special service district. Section 13, which is on page 34, amends the municipal rights, duties, and powers chapter of law, creating a new section authorizing a city or town to adopt an ordinance requiring hotels to be licensed. Uh, section 14 on page 34 is a conforming change. Um, that relates to Senate File 1086. Section 15, uh, pages 34 to 36. Uh, this is Senate File 2165. It dissolves the Municipal Building Commission, which was established in 1903, given the responsibility to care for the courthouse and city hall in Minneapolis. Uh, this section dissolves the commission and provides a mechanism for the city and county to develop an agreement to jointly contribute to the operation of the courthouse and city hall. Section 16, which is on page 36, Senate File 1433 allows the City of St. Paul to solicit and award a design-build contract for a skate park on the east side, or in East Side Heritage Park in St. Paul. Section 17 on page 36 is a re, there, there are two repealers. Uh, the first, paragraph A, repeals the cap, it's from Senate File 1086, repeals the cap imposed on salaries of employees of political subdivisions of the state. And paragraph B repeals several statutes related to the Municipal Building Commission, um, which is dissolved in section 15. Section 18 makes uh, sections 14 and 17, paragraph A, effective the day following final enactment. And this is related to Senate File 1086. The, um, the bill that repealed the cap imposed on salaries of political subdivisions. Thank you, Council White. Uh, Senator Murphy, it's my understanding you both would like to move an amendment, but that we also have two additional testifiers, the Department of Administration and MMB, who would like to testify briefly. Is there an order you would like those two things to occur in? Madam Chair, I'd like to move um, the A4 amendment while Council is with me. Um, you know, just put uh, the bill into the order that uh, I'd like it. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Murphy, Murphy moves the A4 amendment. We will make sure everyone gets that. We almost have that to everyone. Senator Murphy, would you like to comment on it briefly? I'm going to turn to Council James. Madam Chair and members, uh, this amendment uh, incorporates um, Senate File 2224, uh, Senator Mitchell's bill relating to the sust sustainable building um, provisions for uh, buildings built with state um, geo bond money. So Section 23 
is the same as Section 1 in Senator Mitchell's bill, and it modifies the requirements related to en energy efficiency for s state building projects. And Section uh, 24 eliminates a requirement that state agencies have to consider meeting at least 2% of energy needs of a building from renewable sources located on building site. And then it also precludes the total aggregate nameplate capacity of all renewable energy sources used to meet the SB 2030 standards in a state-owned building. Um, and then it also um, provides for um, the Section 28. It extends the allowable term from seven years to 10 years for repayment on a loan to a state agency under a state building energy improvement conservation loan program. And it repeals two sections. Um, the repeal of, in paragraph B of 16B point, uh, no, sorry, in paragraph D, 16B.323, that's a repeal of requirements for installation of solar energy systems on new state buildings and major renovations of existing state buildings unless the cost um, exceeded spe specified thresholds. And then 16B.326 um, also in that paragraph D is, is a repeal of a requirement that the Commissioner of Administration review a project proposer's study for geothermal and solar thermal applications um, for capital projects. Thank you, Council. Senate, uh, Senator Murphy, Murphy moves the A4. Are there any questions? Um, uh, Madam Chair, oh, um, I'd like to ask um, Council White to also um, speak. To My apologies, the Council White. Uh, Madam Chair and members, um, on the A4 Amendment 3.13 through 3.20 amends Article 2, Section 4 related to self-insurance pools. This was a request by the League of Minnesota Cities um, and the State Board of Investment. Um, what this language does is it, is it narrows the um, investments for which the uh, self-insurance pools um, can invest, and it requires um, the investments under the section be um, subject to the limitations under existing law, and that a qualifying government may invest with the State Board of Investment subject to the terms and minimum amounts uh, adopted by the State Board of Investment. Thank you, Council. And Madam Chair, on this section, this is an amendment to the, uh, the Senator Westland provision uh, that is included in this bill, and the amendment that is here is at the request with the approval of Senator Westland at the request of the League of, Minnesota, League of Minnesota Cities and the State Board of Investment who are here, if the committee would like to hear from them. Thank you very much, Senator Murphy. Are there any questions for Senator Murphy? Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess, uh, Madam Chair, the question would be for you, um, and that is uh, we have before us uh, originally a delete everything amendment, um, the A3, and now we are entertaining another amendment, which appears to me to also amend Senate File 1424. It appears we've got two amendments in front of us that uh, are operating at the same time. So Senator Murphy, this would be an amendment to the amendment, is that correct? That's correct, Madam Chair. Which I believe is authorized. Senator um, Draskowski. Madam Chair, that's not how I read uh, the, um, oh, it is. I missed one part of it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any other questions on A4, which is the amendment to the delete all? Senator Cran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Murphy, on, on the, uh, we, I mean, we saw this bill before. Um, I don't think we asked the question. So it sounds like it covers government-funded, government-owned. Would a, would a project under MHFA for housing fall under these requirements? Um, thank you, Senator Coran, for the question. And I have someone here from the Department of Administration who is who is shaking her head no. Can
Can you please state your name and uh, title for the record? Uh, Julie Bio from the Department of Administration. This would not apply to um, housing finance agency. They have their, they are exempt from the sustainable building guidelines. They have their own um, guidelines that they follow. Madam Chair. Senator Cran. And so this will only apply to state owned facilities. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, correct, bond funded um, projects. And I, I take that back. It's could be local owned projects that are funded with bond funds. Madam Chair. Senator Cran. So we, we, we bond a lot of housing. Um, are they, they have an exclusion regardless of the funding mechanism? Madam Chair, that's correct. Okay. And so, Madam Chair, so the new infrastructure with the capital investment bill that's got hundreds of millions in nonprofit building infrastructure, will all of those be required to meet these standards? Go ahead. Madam Chair, um, currently, if it is funded with general fund, unless explicitly outlined in the bill that it would be required, general fund bond, or general funded projects would not fall under these guidelines. Madam Chair. Go ahead. For, for any projects that are bonded, because this won't be just for this year, it'll be for this year and every year forward, will a project, will all of these types of projects be required? As your previous definition, you said only those that are funded, MHFA has an exclusion specifically, but all buildings that are funded with, with uh, bonding dollars would be required to meet these standards. Madam Chair, We're under general obligation bond funds. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And so, Madam Chair, so how much do we believe this will increase the cost? We have a whole host of costs being placed on all of our building today which makes Minnesota really uncompetitive. So all of these costs um, that are gonna grow, uh, do we have any idea of how much additional cost this will add to the, another government mandate onto the use of these dollars in the construction of new infrastructure? Madam Chair, so the sustainable building guidelines are already in law. These changes we hope will make it easier for um, entities, state and local entities to meet those requirements so that they wouldn't have to necessarily um, install the solar or renewable energy on site. They could take advantage of um, other programs that utilities have. So we do not anticipate that this would increase costs relative to current law. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Cran. So, it, and thank you for bringing me to my next point, <laughs> is, is the, uh, it's great that you want to impose the visual blight on every place except for the facility or the area that is going to build this new infrastructure or any state or college that receives those funds. I believe that's also covered. Um, I don't like it because it, I don't know about you, but I live in the area. I've got more solar gardens, which is typically um, industrial solar. I've worked hard to permit those in a contiguous environment. But when you look at solar gardens, it's a visual blight in the scenic byways of the St. Croix River Valley, which is my district. I currently have, until Senator Matthews uh, adds 420 megawatt solar farm up in, up in, uh, I think Benton County. Um, the, uh, those, will litter our, those will litter our roadways. And it also brings in, because of the type of project it is, it's commercial spot zoning. These types, this particular bill will add more of that visual blight to all of rural Minnesota. Senator Coran, and, and I will let you continue, but if I may as a reminder, this is a bill that was already heard and this was actually one that was voted on. Um, yep. I carried this bill and so I remember this exact same yep. almost speech being given at the time. And if you would like to give it again, Ma Madam that's, Chair. that's fabulous, Mr. Coran. Madam Senator Chair, unfortunately, Coran, but, unfortunately the first time we talked about it, there was no movement and it's still being reproposed for inclusion. And so if it's such a great deal, I, d I believe it should be put forth um, and, and it should be, we should keep it on site. Geothermal, do whatever else you can to meet those energy guidelines. If it's so good and it's so wonderful, then it should be right in your own backyard. 
And I don't care whether it's rooftop or you get to buy additional acres for those beautiful campus, college campuses, which would be littered with this. Um, and that's what I'm opposed to, because everybody wants this. But nobody wants it in their own backyard. So I'm, I'm opposed to this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coran. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, could, <clears throat> could Ms. James or Ms. White go back over the repealers that are in this uh, new am amendment to the amendment? I'd like to be refreshed on those, uh, those repealers and what they do. Uh, Ms. James. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson and members, um, the repealer section is deleted and replaced in the amendment. Uh, the, the repealers that are in the A3, um, that whole section is deleted and then replaced in the A4. So the first three paragraphs of the repealer on the A4 are the ones that you saw in the A3. And the first one, paragraph A, is the Candidate Advisory Council for Minsky's Board of Trustees. The second one um, is the electric vehicle charging station fee requirement. Uh, paragraph C is the Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution and a related grant program. And then uh, paragraph D was, the, was one of the were the new ones related that came from Senate File 2224 on the sustainable building guidelines. So, Madam Chair, uh, what, what the uh, bill, or what uh, item number B under the repealer uh, does is basically takes away the uh, charging fee that was supposed to be charged by the Department of Administration, uh, takes that away so there is no fee. Am I correct in saying that? Ms. James? Um, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, uh, no, that's not right because the, the bill also um, has an electric vehicle charging station section that requires the commissioner to charge a fee. It just doesn't give any parameters for how that fee is to be set. This is on page 14 at line 23. So, Madam Chair, Ms. James, what does this repealer, it says electric fee charging fee, is not, what, is, what happens to it? in this repealer, uh, subdivision 13. Ms. James. Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, the current section is repealed. A new section that partially copies the old section is moved to a different area of the statutes dealing with parking uh, things. Um, but then also, it requires the commissioner to set a fee, but it does not have what the old or the current electric charging fee section has, which is parameters around how that fee has to be set. So it sounds like it's dependent upon somebody to decide whether there's going to be a fee or not a fee. Uh, to me, it uh, looks like we're, we're not collecting a fee. Uh, Madam Chair. So I, Madam S Chair. Senator Anderson, I, that's actually, if I can clarify that, um, I remember that part of the testimony from when we did this as well, and there is a fee being collected, but because of the way the units are aggregated, um, they want to do it as a flat fee versus being able to set how long each individual one is charging for, because that's not how it is set up, but there is still a fee that is going to be charged, and it will be enough to cover any expenses by the state. Madam Chair, does that say that in the bill? Um, we can have that testimony again from the administration. What's the flat fee that's going to be ch charged? Madam Chair, Julie Byrell from the Department of Administration. So our equipment does not meter each station individually per charge. Um, we get a bill at the end of the month that shows how much was used by the electric uh, vehicle chargers. And so we average that out for um, the month, and that's what, how we set that fee. Thank you, Ms. Byrell. Senator Anderson? I don't, and what's, what is the fee? Madam Chair, currently it is $50 per month. Per individual? Senator, Madam Chair, <laughs> that's correct. Ms. Byrell. For every uh, electric vehicle charging contract, parking contract. Thank you. 
Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hey was going to dig into that piece there a little bit too and if I'm not mistaken I'm just to clarify this make sure I got that right you're moving the electrical vehicle charging from one part of statute to another and then you're taking away the instead of recouping cost is what the old one was you're now actually charging a fee is that kind of close I mean there was I did get a difference in the uh, uh, the way it was written in the old statute to the new one the old one if I understood it right said you have to recoup costs in this one. Now we're going to be charging a fee, which will actually be maybe slightly over cost. True? Not true? Ms. Byrell. Madam Chair. Um, correct. We will be charging for the electricity. Okay. Next question. Se oh, I, I have okay. two or three, Madam Chair. Okay. Senator, thank you. Or Senator Barr. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Murphy, um, you've got a copy of the DE in front of you? Yeah. Uh, Pardon me? Do you have a copy of DE? Uh, yeah, I line do. Line 9.20. When we were doing the walkthrough on that, they mentioned this was a, uh, an, uh, I guess what my question is going to be oh, procedure yeah. only. How did this end up back in here? Because you said we voted it out of committee, and this reflects a, an amendment that was taken on in judiciary. So if it was in judiciary, did the bill then come back to our committee and get included, get referred back? I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, Senator Barr, can you tell me again where you are in the bill? 9.20. Thank you, Senator Barr. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Um, as I understand it, uh, once a committee has moved a piece of policy in a committee, um, we don't have to take the physical jacket back into our committee in order to consider uh, the policy change. So procedurally, okay. as I understand it, this is the way we do our work in the Senate. And I can look to council for confirmation because we talked about this uh, yesterday. Ms. James. Madam Chair and members, um, yes, Senator Murphy is right that uh, it's not untypical to include provisions that may, that have passed through our committee and maybe have gone somewhere else, but also this particular bill, 2225, has been uh, re-referred back to us. Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. One last question, and I appreciate the answer. I just was trying to follow along. Um, page 1.16, or one right up front. Um, you, the word consulted is in there. I'm kind of curious why consulted as opposed to something a little more, um, I don't know, restrictive, inclusive? Because we could consult on something and we could still disagree and then move on. So if uh, we're going to um, allow for outside contracts, just because we consult with somebody doesn't necessarily mean we agree. So it, does that obligate the, uh, uh, the exec if the executive director consults with the the chair and the vice chair of the commission and they disagreed, is that still, a, when it says consult, I mean, maybe the legal term means something different? I'm not sure if you could help me clarify. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Barr. And Senator, Senator Mitchell, um, Ms. Weber, Weber here, the director from uh, if the you can see is here. Please state your name and title for the record. Madam Chair and members, my name is Michelle Weber and I'm the Executive Director of the Legislative Coordinating Commission. Um, each year, the Legislative Coordinating Commission body approves the total budget and all of the items for which the LCC serves as a fiscal agent on behalf of the legislature. The language here mirrors the authority that's granted to the reviser of statute as well in terms of their contracting authority and so that's where the word consulted comes from. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Follow up? Senator Barr. Okay, you're mirroring language, but that didn't really answer the question. So if I consult and we disagree, does that still allow for the ability to execute an outside contract? Ms. Weber. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Barr, uh, it is not it has not been my practice as the executive director if the LCC chair or vice chair do not authorize something, I do not move forward with it. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Follow up? Senator Barr. I'm not saying that you didn't, but you're not always going to be the director, and we're putting statute in place for future directors. So that's my question is, would this allow? Even if you don't use the practice, that's, I'm not, I'm not trying to be 
accusatorial here, mm -hmm. accusing, but we're actually placing language in that will be there after you're there, unless you plan on living longer than the, the legislature does. But uh, I'm assuming most of us will expire before the state of Minnesota does. Um, so that's my question is, shouldn't that be a little bit more restrictive? It, it seems to allow, even if you disagreed, that you could still execute on the contract. And that's, that's my only point. Um, Ms. Weber or Ch Ms. Mur Senator Murphy? Um, Madam Chair and Senator Barr, uh, last year when this language was brought forward, um, the House and Senate did carry different provisions and the um, Senate did amend the language last year to say that the approval had to be granted. Thank you, Senator Barr. Are there any other, Senator Draskowski? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to go back to the electrical vehicle, electric vehicle charging. I'm reading the new language in the amendment to the amendment on page 14. Um, and basically, that language just turns it over to the commissioner and says, Commissioner, you can determine what the fee is. We don't give them any direction at all. I'm reading current statute that uh, subdivision 13 in uh, chapter section 16B.24, and I'll read it to you, members. The commissioner shall require that a user of a charging station located on the capital complex used to charge a private electric vehicle pay an electric service fee. The commissioner shall set the electric service fee rate to cover the electricity costs for charging an electric vehicle and for the administrative costs associated with providing electric charging stations. So as I see it, members, um, um, as Senator Murphy, Madam Chair, it looks to me like we are giving the administration even less direction and further ceding our authority as a legislature, once again, Madam Chair, to the executive branch, I don't understand the motivation behind this, uh, why uh, one of the two bodies here representing the people of the state of Minnesota in our uh, need to write the law and determine the policy of the state of Minnesota, which is our charge, it's our constitutional charge, uh, pun intended, Madam Chair. Um, I couldn't resist, <laughs> I just thought of it. <laughs> why in the world would we turn, once again, this authority over, uh, Madam Chair, why are we turning the authority over the executive branch and just basically saying, exe executive branch, charge however you want, charge whatever amount you want. Uh, Senator Barr, they could charge less than the, the cost or they could charge more than the cost. They could put taxpayers in a position of subsidizing the cost of electric vehicles um, here at the Capitol Complex or uh, they could charge those people who drive electric vehicles twice the amount uh, or three times the amount that it actually costs. We're turning it over to the commissioner solely to determine this with absolutely no direction. I don't understand why. Senator Murphy, do you? Senator Murphy, or would you prefer Ms. Ms. Spiro? Madam Chair and Senator Dreskowski, um, our witness testified that they would be charging for the cost of electricity, um, which I believe is what we would want them to do. Ms. Spiro. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, our intent would be to charge for the, elect the average electric electricity cost for the month. Senator Draskowski. So Madam Chair and um, Senator Murphy, if we were gonna do that, you could simply go to uh, 16B.24 and you could strike uh, the second part that says to provide for the administrative costs associated with providing electric charging stations. That would leave there in the current statute exactly what Ms. Blyle said. Instead of that, we turn it over completely to the commissioner and say, Commissioner, whatever you want to do. That's what your language in the amendment to the amendment does. It gives them no guidance. It doesn't say they have to cover the costs or anything. I don't, I don't understand if, if, the, if the approach is to apparently get rid of the need for electric vehicle owners to pay for the costs associated with charging stations, which is the only difference between what was testified and what the current statute says. Ms. Spiro. Madam Chair. 
So we are, part of the reason why we're repealing the old one is we're moving it from our facilities statutes to our parking statutes. Um, we can't say, uh, because our equipment does not um, meter per charge, we can't say that explicitly it's just going to be for the electricity per charge. So we are saying that the commissioner will set the fee. So Madam Chair and Ms. Boyle and Senator Murphy, can we, uh, can we at least put some language in this bill that says uh, the commissioner shall take into consideration the costs of the state and somehow most closely match the fee to the, the costs incurred by the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota? Is that acceptable to the administration? Ms. Byro. Um, Madam Chair, I would have to talk to our um, facilities folks on exact language, but we could certainly work with you and get back to you on that. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Ms. Blyle. I Members, I, I just become more and more frustrated with our propensity as a body to turn our legislative responsibility over carte blanche to the executive branch. And this is just a very small example, and Ms. Blyle, thank you. Um, I hope we can do that, I've, whatever I can do to help, and I'm sure Senator Murphy's extremely capable. I'm sure she would help with that as well, but um, members, we gotta stop turning over our responsibility to the executive branch, and here it is again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Murphy, Ms. Blyle. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Senator Barr. Just a quick one. We're still on A4, is that correct? The amendment to the amendment, correct? Uh, Senator Murphy, my understanding is you intend to move them together. Yep. Is that correct? That's right, Madam Chair. So, so when you're ready, we can take a vote. Point, um, maybe... we can take questions on anything. Is that also correct? That is right, Senator okay. Mitchell. And we do have a couple of people who'd like to testify. Would you like to do that at this time, Senator Murphy? It'd be great if we would move the amendment. Madam Chair. <laughs> Senator, well, Senator Barr was first. Okay, Senator Anderson. Madam Chair, could I ask the, the uh, author of the bill to use her outside voice? <laughs> Senator I only Anderson. have one voice, Senator Anderson, and you and I just have a hard time connecting. <laughs> Body, we will continue answering questions on this, but I would like to move the amendments now so that we can get it in the shape and that the two testifiers can come up. Um, so with that said, Senator Murphy, would you like to, to move your own um, amendments? I'd like to move uh, the A3 amendment, the delete all, uh, incorporating the A4 amendment uh, as an amendment to the amendment. We have a motion to uh, incorporate the A4 into the A3. Um, I no one's Okay. Uh, if our remote. Okay, to clarify, it is to amend the bill with the A3 amended by the A4. All in favor? And this is a verbal vote. Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. no. The ayes have it. Senator Murphy, would you like to bring up your testifiers? Yep, uh, Senator Mitchell, uh, Chair Mitchell, I would like to invite uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Ray Tan uh, and um, whoever is coming from the Department of the, Administra the Administration to come up and join me. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Good to see you here. <laughs> Whomever you would like to go first, if you could state your name and title for the record, please. Madam Chair, before we start that, did we ever adopt the A4 into the A3? I don't believe we voted on it, that. It, I know per, we just we per just council, on the A3. Did I miss something? Uh, I, I'm sorry, before we go on, just want to get that clear. Council James can explain, okay. but it, it was done as one. Council James? Madam Chair and members, yes, the motion was to amend the bill with the A3 as amended by the A4. So the motion incorporated both. So, so Madam Chair, when did we have the vote to incorporate the A4 into the A3? 
Uh, Council James. Madam Chair and members, you, you took it as one motion to amend the bill with the A3 as amended by the A4. Okay, thank you. I want to make sure I'm following along. Senator I, Barr, I, totally I learned that. something new as well, but I was told that was possible, and okay, that is thank what you. we did. <laughs> Back to the testifiers. I apologize for the interruption. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, and good afternoon. I'm Britta Rayton, Deputy Commissioner at Minnesota Management and Budget. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to give some very brief testimony today. Uh, first, I wanted to um, thank Senator Murphy for including our recommended language to revise and modernize the types of collateral that banks, banks can use uh, to collateralize state funds. As I mentioned in my previous testimony, this creates alignment in statute with how um, collateral is, is structured for local government funds, and it will ease administrative burden for the banks as well as for our um, staff at MMB that, that help work with the banks on this issue. Um, second, I just wanted to highlight that there was a provision that we had proposed that's not included. Uh, we had requested repeal of the interagency transfer report. Um, we understand that there is potentially um, some willingness to more narrowly tailor that required report in order to get at the information that the, the, the legislature is really targeting. Um, I just wanted to um, state publicly that we are willing to work with you um, along with our agency partners to craft some recommended language to more narrowly tailor that report so it's not quite so cumbersome in really getting at the data that, the, that would provide value to the legislature. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Go ahead and please state your name for the record. Madam Chair, members, my name is Stacy Christensen. I'm Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Administration, and I will also be very brief. Uh, thank you for including many of admin's policy provisions in the omnibus policy bill. As you know, admin has a wide-ranging set of responsibilities that ultimately touch every part of state government. We work primarily behind the scenes to provide business functions that are the administrative backbone for public agencies. These functions include managing facilities, providing resources for data practices compliance, overseeing state procurement, and assisting with energy efficient improvements. The changes included will clean up the statutes to provide greater clarity, enhance state procurement, and correct obsolete statutes. They include increasing state contracts with targeted group, economically disadvantaged, and veteran-owned small businesses, affirming admin's efforts to improve compliance with the sustainable billing requirements and make state operations more cost-effective, improve transparency by codifying the data challenge appeal process currently in rule, and general cleanup of our statutes related to transfers of responsibility, responsibilities formerly housed at other entities. The changes will keep admin statutes streamlined and current while ensuring adequate oversight of the agency's work. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Murphy, do you have any other comments on the bill before we go to questions or amendments? Uh, uh, Senator Mitchell, Madam Chair, I would like to invite um, Mr. Bruce uh, to come up and speak briefly about the amendment that was added in the language to the way that uh, nego negotiated contracts are implemented. Should have asked if there were any additional testifiers. Mr. Bruce, can you please state your name and title for the record? Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Devin Bruce. I'm the Public Affairs Coordinator for the Minnesota Association of Professional Employees, MAPE. Um, I just wanted to quickly go over some of the uh, changes that were not in the original underlying bill um, for uh, Senate File uh, 2456. Um, as I testified earlier, uh, we had to incorporate some uh, clarifying language to ensure that uh, particularly the Minnesota State uh, uh, um, Collective Bargaining Agreements would be implemented um, uh, by them and not by MMB. Uh, so on lines one, just going through the list of changes for the uh, A3 amendment on lines 1.29 through 1.31, uh, it has clarifying language that the compensation plans and salary plans uh, that are for the unrepresented employees still travel through the SER and need to be ratified by the legislature. Um, in on lines 2.04 through 20.4 er, 20 um, to 20.11, um, it eliminates a cross-reference that would, would not be relevant under the new proposed process for ratifying or for uh, enacting collective bargaining agreements. Um, and then in finally in two. 24.14 through 
22, it just clarifies that it's uh, Minnesota State that negotiates and implements the, uh, certain faculty collective bargaining agreements, and those CBAs are implemented after the approval of the memberships by the exclusive representatives. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruce. Senator Murphy, are there any other testifiers at this time? I would just remind the committee that if you want to hear from Mr. Carlson or for the State Board of Investment that they're here if you have questions about that portion of the Senator Westland bill that is included in this proposal. Thank you for the reminder, Senator Murphy. At this time, are there any amendments? Seeing no amendments, are there any questions for the author or testifiers? Given no questions or amendments, I would you like to, to move your bill, Senator Murphy? Uh, uh, yes, I would. I can do it if you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I would, before I move the bill, I would like to um, or say thank, anything. thank the members. Um, and I also want to say that I have heard the concerns specifically from Senator Draskowski, and we'll work with you on that language uh, to make sure that we've got the electric charging uh, issue right. And we can do that before we go to the floor. I appreciate mm -hmm. your questions. And I think you've raised an important issue. Um, Senator Barr and I are gonna be working on that issue around um, the report and the, uh, to make sure that we're getting the right information that we need. Um, and we're not just creating reporting. Um, I think that this process is difficult. And as I have listened to us today, uh, I want you to know that as the chair of the committee, I'm working really hard to try and balance two things, to make sure that we have the time that we need uh, to do our work together, um, to make sure that the voices of both the majority and the minority are heard. And sometimes I will get feedback from my colleagues that I am uh, giving too much latitude. I don't think that's right. I think it is important that we give the committee the time to ask the questions that they have. Uh, before us on the bills that are before us. And you've asked your questions today and I appreciate that. And we'll continue to work with you as this comes to the floor. And you have my commitment to continue to work with everybody on the committee as we build the two subsequent omnibus bills. I wanna thank Council, Council James and Council White, of course, our fiscal analyst and all of the staff, including the pages who are working to make this, uh, this process work for us so we can do the work that we choose to do for the people of Minnesota. I also wanna thank people from the administration, from the commission, uh, from, from all of the participants that have brought uh, us to this point. And with that then, Madam Chair, I'd like to move Senate file 1424 as amended uh, to pass. Thank you, um, Senator Murphy. There is a motion for 1424 as amended. This would be going to the floor. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay? No. And okay. Um, those who are remote, could you please turn on your cameras? And so all who are in favor, could you please raise your hand? Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Oh, I apologize. Senator. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know on a, a division vote if that uh, by rule is allowed to happen with uh, people that are on a remote situation. Senator, or um, uh, Council James. I think that's one of the rules that we passed. Madam Chair, Council I can provide is... a little advice as well because I asked this question yesterday during committee. Oh, Senator Lang. Uh, the rule is that I heard one voice from a remote voter, that person will be able to remotely vote with a, uh, a division. The rest of the voters will not be allowed uh, per Senate rules. I think the council would probably agree with that. So council is saying that to make sure everything is clarified, we can now go as a roll call. Madam Chair, Madam, Chair, for, Madam Chair, I'd ask for a roll call. Oh, Senator Murphy asks for a roll call. I, I am literally just listening to counsel. Madam 
Madam Chair, when was the roll call re requested for this? Okay. Um, so, Senator Lang, since you say you specifically just heard one person, what one person? Council is checking. There is some furious typing going on over here. Senator Lang, I appreciate the feedback. Um, we're, I'm hearing two issues. One, that with Zoom, the way Zoom um, has a primary speaker, you might only hear one, even if everyone has their microphones on. So that could be the one voice. And even though they asked you where you heard this from yesterday, they are not finding the same um, feedback with what they are looking at right now. Madam Chair. Senator Murphy. If it pleases the committee, we can proceed with the division. So, as Senator Murphy, we were trying to determine if everyone gets to vote, which is present and remotely. Um, Council's belief is that present and remote can vote. So if everyone in favor, including those of you remote, could please raise your hand. Can you take the roll? Can you take the count? Yeah. Everyone who voted yes for the motion for the bill to move, please raise your hand. Everyone who voted against, please raise your hand. Okay, so we had um, six yeses, seven noes on the division. Senator Murphy. Madam Chair, being uh, on the prevailing side of the vote, I ask for reconsideration and I ask for a roll call vote. Senator Murphy moves reconsideration and a roll call vote is being, the first vote will be on the reconsideration. And we will take a roll call on that. Chair Mitchell? Yes, on reconsideration. Lead Anderson? No. 
Senator Barr? No. Senator Spazinski? Yes. No. What? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I want a yes vote. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> okay. Senator Driskowski? No. Senator Fate? Yes. Senator Gustafson? Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Curran? No. Senator Lang? No. Senator May Quaid? Yes. Senator Morrison? Yes. S Senator Carlson, I'm so sorry. Yes. <laughs> Senator Murphy? Yes. The tally for the reconsider is seven ayes and six noes. And Madam Chair, then I'll move that Senate file 1424 be recommended to pass and I ask for a roll call. Thank you, Senator Murphy. As amended, by the way. Uh, we have a motion for Senator, Senate file 1424 as amended to be passed and moved to the floor and we will be taking a roll call. Chair Mitchell? Yes. Lead Anderson? No. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Barr? No. I did it out of order, I apologize. Um, Senator Swidzinski? Yes. Senator Dreskowski? No. Senator Fate. Yes. Senator Gustafson. <coughs> Senator Jasinski. No. Senator Curran. No. Senator Lang. No. Senator May Quaid. Yes. Senator Morrison. Yes. Senator Murphy. Yep. And with seven yeas and um, six nays, the motion passes. Senate file 1424 is, amendment, is amended, moves to the floor. With no other business before us today, I call the meeting adjourned. Thank you for your time. <laughs>